Welcome to yet another episode of Game of Thrones Abridged, in which we speed through the Game of Thrones books like Mercury, that that fleetest of foot of of the Roman gods, with the little winged the little winged boots, because that's how you got messages around before email. Before Ravens, in this case, because of course we are talking about Game of Thrones, uh, and we are reading the chapter uh, Catelyn Three, A Game of Thrones, the third Catelyn chapter. So this is set at Winterfell, uh, and a whole bunch of the Starks have just gone south, and Jon Snow has just gone north. Everyone's kind of left Winterfell, uh, leaving Cat and Rob and all those guys to manage things, and Bran, of course is in his sick bed, withering, dying, apparently. Well, apparently not dying, but but certainly not uh, terribly well, uh, is Bran Stark, um, still in his sort of coma. Um, I wonder how medically real possible it is in these medieval societies for someone to survive in a coma for a long time. Is it a coma? I'm not a doctor. Anyway, so... Uh, so... Catelyn has been standing by Bran's bedside all this time for days and days and weeks and weeks, waiting and grieving uh, intensely. Uh, but of course, while this is happening, uh, there are practical matters to be dealt with. So Maester Lewin uh, comes in to to Bran's sick room. Uh, where Catelyn is and says, "Oh, we need to we need to review the figures. Uh, we need to look at uh, exactly how much how much cost was incurred by 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 the visit of of the king and his and his homies." Uh, and Catelyn's like, "Oh, I don't need to look at numbers because I know what uh, what the visit cost us." Looking at Bran, so Catelyn's saying that the only thing that that matters, the thing that we really lost out of this royal visit was 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 Bran's incapacitation, was Bran's injury. Um, and then Lewin sort of <laughs> sort of ignores her drama and goes on and says, oh, but we need to choose more more positions for people at Winterfell because like the people have gone south, so now we need a new stu- uh, a new steward and, and, and we need a new captain of guards and we new, need a new master of horse and and Callan's like a master of horse and so she's very dramatically emotionally saying like enough with this fucking practical. Uh, tedious bureaucracy bullshit. I'm not interested. All I care about right now uh, is my son, my crippled son, uh, unconscious in his sick bed. Um, and Lewin, of course, who is a he is a man of he is he is a lord of small matters. He is a man who concerns himself with the details. Is quite thrown aback by Catelyn's uh, greater interest in her dying son than than in the practicalities. Also, Catelyn describes uh, Lewin as a little grey rat. Which is sort of a recurring description of the maesters as rats, as grey folk, uh, uh, which is interesting. Lewin is normally looked on very positively, but in this case, in Cat's state, she sees Lewin as a little grey rat. Um, uh, anyway, so yeah, Catelyn is is mad and sad and and grieving, uh, and and so we got that tension there. But Lewin's like, well, someone's got to deal with this shit. And then right on cue, da da, Rob Rob steps in. Rob Stark steps in, and he's like, I'll make the appointments. So right on right on cue, Rob is stepping up to take responsibility to do what needs to be done uh, when no one else will. Um, so something that we'll note many times throughout this chapter is Rob, uh, really stepping up and becoming a man as opposed to a boy. That sort of man-boy dichotomy is important for Rob in this chapter. Uh, so it's noted that Rob is wearing a sword now, like an actual steel sword as opposed to the wooden practice swords he's been using up till now. Uh, so we have (coughs) description of, uh, Rob, uh, we have, uh, and Cat, and Cat notices that, like, you know, Rob... Like a lot of the Stark kids look more like Cat than than like Ned, um, uh, but Cat but Cat says that well this time she notices something like Eddard Stark in Rob's face for the first time she sees a bit of Ned in Rob, um, which is interesting, um, and uh, so Rob's kind of complaining look you can't stay in this sick bed all the time. Uh, Mum, you've got to fucking get your shit together a little bit. Um, 
And and Catelyn talks about how oh you know she was begging Ned to stay at Winterfell inst- instead of leaving with with Bran sick and stuff. But but Ned Ned told Cat that that he had no choice. He had to go south. But then he left, choosing. So we have this sort of rumination on on what it really means to be free and to have responsibilities and to make choices. Because like yeah, Ned does feel so bound on a bound by all of his responsibilities and duties. But I mean you know at the end of the day he could choose to to act in defiance of them um we always what's that line from that movie we always have a choice what's that from there's some maybe yeah whatever um so blah blah blah, 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 blah. uh and and catelyn's like look i, I just it's it, the most important thing to me is to look after bran uh and rob's like yeah but other people need you too like rickon needs you he's three years old little rickon stark uh he's crying and he's so upset because everyone's leaving he thinks everyone's deserting him Little Rickon needs you. Three years old. Bloody toddler. I don't think he'll be gunned down by Ramsay Snow anytime soon. Can you imagine a little three-legged... Not three-legged. Little three... Two-legged three-year-old running running on the battlefield at the Battle of the Bastards like happened in, in season six of the show? I don't think so. Rickon's fate will be very different in the books compared to the show. Anyway, um... Uh, and Rob also betrays some vulnerability here, and he's saying, "And I need you too, mother. I need you. I need your support." Um, and we're reminded that he's only fourteen. So on the one hand, Rob is stepping up to take responsibilities, but on the other hand, he's also a boy who wants his mommy. So there's a bit of a bit of both uh, with Rob here. Uh, and they also mention that the dire wolves are howling outside, uh, and Rob opens the window. You remember there was that line previously about how when the when the windows open, Bran is stronger. Uh, but anyway, um, so yeah, we have more sort of allusion to the connection that the Diwolves have to the kids, uh, and Catelyn's unsettled, uh, by the howling, and she's, and she has a sort of moment of, uh, a little sort of outburst of grief, uh, and, and, and the Diwolves howl, howl more and more, and the dogs howl more and more, and they're like, holy shit, there's a fire, yo, there's a fire, the library tower is on fire, um, and Catelyn is like, oh, thank God, it's just the library tower. And Rob's like, what the fuck? What? That's not good. But Catelyn is thinking like, oh, that that is uh, far away in Winterfell. That, that, that's, that's a distant building. The fire's unlikely to reach us, and more importantly, Bran. Because Catelyn is, again, only concerned about Bran and nothing else at this point. Um, although she does note that she's a bit sad about all of the books all of the all of the books in the library that the Starks have gathered over centuries, which apparently are now going up in flames. Um, we never see the, uh, Winterfell Library, um, in the show. Anyway, uh, so, uh, so Rob runs off to deal with the fire, um, but Catelyn stays in Bran's bedchamber, and as soon as they've all gone, uh, Cat sees that a man is in the room with her. You weren't supposed to be here. He mutters, uh, and the man is described. He's a he's a small, dirty man. His clothing is filthy and brown, and he stinks, and he's gaunt, and he's got deep sunk eyes. Because of course, a baddie has to be ugly, right? A baddie has to be gross and dirty, right? Like the you ever see those historical pictures from like London uh, of like, this is what a criminal looks like with scrawny little eyes and a dirty face. And this is what a noble gentleman looks like, a good high class Briton. That whole idea of like, you can tell someone's criminality by their appearance. Even George, who was kind of all about um, like, like recognizing human complexity and diversity. Even he frequently indulges in this idea of bad people are ugly and gross, while pretty people are more often good. I mean, I mean, of course, there are definite rejoinders to that in the series, like the Lannisters, the most beautiful and cruel of them all. <coughs> but there's still a certain indulgence in the idea of ugly people being bad, and I think that's a bit lazy, but whatever. Uh, so there's a man with a dagger standing over Catelyn, uh, and he he sort of intimates that he's there to assassinate Bran uh, and Catelyn. They have a they have an altercation. So Catelyn tries to stop the man from assassinating Bran. She grabs his dagger with both hands, uh, and, and 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 the blade bites deep, and there's blood everywhere. And she 
bites him and she goes into this this rage, this fucking mama bear protection intense. You know that thing about how, you know, women can women like lifting cars up to to get their kids from adrenaline fucking it's all happening here. We're all la- all fight on all engines. It's it's intense. So she's fighting and she's and she's struggling with this guy uh and 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 he sort of manages to knock her down, but then a shadow slips in through the open door behind him, and the wolf leaps and takes down the man and rips out his fucking throat. Uh, Brand's wolf, she realizes. Brand's wolf has come to save him. Um, and once the man's dead, the dire wolf summer uh, calmly cleans all the blood off of Catelyn's hand and then goes to sleep on Bran's bed. And then Catelyn just, like, breaks down. She laughs hysterically uh, after the assassin is dead. Um, so Catelyn's kind of losing it a little bit. But you gotta, you got to note that, like, this is kind of a vindication of Catelyn's uh, whole concern. Like, Catelyn was determined to stay by Bran's bedside the entire time for fear that something would happen to him while she wasn't there. And indeed, in the end... Some uh, some danger did come to Bran, and Catelyn was there to help protect Bran, and Bran may well be dead if it wasn't for Catelyn being there. So while Catelyn certainly is pretty fucking off kilter at this point, um, a bit short of some marbles, she definitely uh, has kind of had her point proven to some extent. Uh, she she did she her actions did protect her son. Uh, so anyway, so then everyone comes back, uh, presumably after dealing with the fire. Uh, to find what's happened, um, and and then Catelyn sort of allows herself to be looked after. Uh, she goes and has a bath, and Maester Lewin tends to her wounds, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then she sleeps for four days. Um, and then she wakes up feeling somewhat sort of rejuvenated, um, and she feels ashamed of how she was behaving before in terms of her sort of mad grief. Um, and so she sort of gets her, gets her shit together a little bit. Um... And Rob, meanwhile, has apparently been running things. So we, so it's noted that Rob is now dressed in leather and ringmail, boiled leather, no less. One of the sort of memes of Game of Thrones is George's fondness for boiled leather. Uh, and yeah, and, and again, the sword at his waist. So again, we're, we're seeing Rob as this man, as this like powerful, um, someone who's stepping up to take responsibilities. Uh, we also have mention of Hallis Mullen, who's apparently the new uh, captain of guards. And Hallis Mullen is 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 interesting uh, because later on in the series, uh, Hall- Hallis Mullen is the guy who is given the responsibility to take the bones of Ned Stark up to Winterfell uh, from down in River Run or wherever. Um, and yet he never quite <laughs> turns up again. And we have this talk from Barbary Dustin. Barbary Dustin uh, of, 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 of Barriton talks about how uh, she wants to make sure Ned Stark's bones never make it to Winterfell. She's trying to intercept the bones. And so there's all these weird possibilities and this, this little footnote, this little mystery about Hallis Mullen and the bones of Eddard Stark that is, that is yet to be resolved. So Actually, some people think that Hallis Mullen is the hooded man in Winterfell, actually, which is interesting. We do need to do uh, a hooded man in Winterfell video at some point. Anyway, uh, so basically all the sort of, all, 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 all the leaders at Winterfell, Rob and Catelyn and, uh, and, Lu- and Lewin, they all get together to work out, okay, what, what's going on? Why did someone try to kill Bran? Who did it? Um, and Catelyn's immediately like, was it one of the Lannisters? Uh, and, and they're all like, oh yeah, maybe. Um, and they try to work, yeah, Leia, like, apparently the assassin must have been hiding out in the stables, and they're like, well, how did no one see him there? Um, they mention Hodor, who's a stable boy. They, 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 they keep, they describe Hodor as a boy here, which is interesting. Because, um, of course, in, in the show, Hodor is like a 30-year-old man. Um, in, in, in the books, he's a boy. We don't know exactly how old, but, but he's a boy, which is interesting. Because you know how in the show, we learn that, that, that Hodor's origin story... Uh, how how the Hodor became Hodor is that is that Bran goes back into back back to the future back into the time travels, Time Lord and he and he like mind mind fucks uh Ho- Willis in the past in order to change his behavior in the present, uh, which is pretty spooky and that's what breaks Hodor's mind into all the 
into into all its hodorness. Uh, uh, but um, could that work if Hodor of the present is just a boy, right? Because in order to go back to the past, uh, Bran Hodor would have been even younger. Um, cause, cause how long ago was that? That was like, what, like 20 years, 25 years, like the flashback in Winterfell in season six. So if Hodor's a boy now, he might not even be born during that flashback. So this is, so this supports the idea that the Hodor origin story, the hold the door thing, uh, will be different in the books. Maybe not dramatically different, but at least it, it wouldn't make sense for, for the time frames, for the timelines, uh, to be the same. So that's interesting. Uh, anyway, um, so Catelyn's like, well, it seems to me that the assassin was there to kill Bran, and then Rob's like, why would anyone want to kill Bran? Like, he's a sleeping boy. Um, and Catelyn's like, look, well, it must be that someone didn't want him to say something that Bran knew or something. Bran must know something or have the power to do something, and that's why someone tried to assassinate him. Well, also, we have an interruption for lunch. It's like a game of cricket, because they... Lunchtime, someone comes in, and when we and they bring out some bread and butter and honey and blackberry. We have, like, a three-line description of food, because, yes, this is a George R. R. Martin book. Um... And so anyway, they're talking about how shit's going down. Uh, we have more mention of Rob being sort of manly, taking responsibility. They talk about how the the blade of the assassin is Valyrian steel with a dragon bone hilt, which is something that George R. R. Martin has acknowledged as a bit ill-fitting in the sort of world building. Because Valyrian steel is, of course, meant to be impossible. Well, very rare and valuable. Uh, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense for this random assassin to have a blade. Although, of course, that is that, that is the sort of the plot point here, is that the fact that the guy has a Valyrian steel blade suggests that someone rich and influential and powerful must have uh, provided it to the assassin. Um, and, of course, so, so the question here is who, who, who sent the assassin? Um, and w- the, what this chapter leads us to believe is that the Lannisters are responsible, like Jamie Lannister is responsible, is kind of what we're led to believe here. We later find out in Storm, I think, that it was actually apparently Joffrey uh, who tried to get Bran assassinated, apparently just to try to impress King Robert, um, which is misguided. Um, but yeah, like 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 it's it's made pretty clear that it was Joffrey who did it, which which kind of feels like a retcon. Like it it just feels weird that like why would Joffrey want to kill this random cripple? Um, and so it it feels almost as though George might have had different plans here. Like maybe George originally thought that it should have been Jamie who chose to get Bran assassinated in order to protect his secrets, but later changed his mind. It, 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 it's a bit of a pickle to um, not, though. We should do a video on it at some point. Um, but yeah, I, I suspect it's a bit of a retcon thing. Uh, uh, anyway, so... Uh, they all sort of swear an oath because Catelyn's about to drop a secret bomb. And Catelyn reveals that Lysa Arryn told her that the Lannisters murdered Jon Arryn. Uh, and so, therefore, I think that the Lannisters killed Bran, or tried to kill Bran. Uh, and everyone's like, she, truth bomb, uh, and, and, uh, and, and Roderick Castle's like, F- really? Uh, like, like, would, I mean, Jamie Lannister's the Kingslayer, uh, he's a prick, but would he, would he murder an innocent child? Um, I wonder, says Theon Greyjoy, uh, which is which is a legitimately interesting question. Would Jaime Lannister kill a child? Um, th- th- there was that interesting bit in the River Run Siege in Feast where Jaime threatens to Ed Muir to have his infant son hurled at a castle from a trebuchet. Uh, and Jaime himself wonders <coughs> if that was like an empty threat, if he, if he would uh, kill, a, kill a child. Because, of course, one, Jamie's whole sort of struggle is, like, what kind of man is he? What is he capable of? What, how unethically will he behave? So that's a question raised here. Uh, but the point is that we're implicating the Lannisters here, and Rob does this <laughs> foolish thing. He draws his sword and waves it around in the air and says, I'll kill the Lannisters myself. Um, and he's immediately told off for it because it's a very silly, obnoxious, childish way to behave. So, yeah, so so Rob is described as suddenly a child again. So, again, there's this dichotomy between Rob as a man, an adult, and a boy. Um, 
And so they're like, well, look, shit, someone's got to investigate this stuff. Someone's got to go to King's Landing and find out what's going on. What are the Lannisters up to? Someone's got to deal with it. Um, and Rob's like, I'll do it. But, but Callan's like, no, you got to stay. There must always be a Stark in Winterfell. I will go myself. Uh, and so Catelyn has, has decided that she's going to take action. She's going to go to King's Landing with Roderick Castle. And then she shall see what she shall see. So, that's a bit of a change for Catelyn. So, at the, uh, uh, at the start of this chapter, we had Catelyn uh, in full, like, grieving mother mode. She was totally overcome with emotion, and she was committed to staying by Bran Stark's side. Not She was uninterested in the practicalities of Winterfell. All she cared about was her poor, crippled son, Bran. Which, of course, was did seem like a good idea in the end, to, to some extent, because of how it helped protect Bran from an assassin. That's pretty legit. Uh, but at the same time, it obviously wasn't ideal having Catelyn act this way. Uh, so it's interesting that at the end of this chapter, she sort of gets her shit together, and she's like, right, okay, now I will be pragmatic. I've got to deal with shit. And I'm going to go to King's Landing to sort shit out. And Ro- Rob Stark, his son, is do- is going through a similar process. Um, he's he's taking, he's going through the process of of taking responsibility, standing up, being a man a- and a boy, no longer. Uh, and this this is some sort of something that happens to all the Starks, really, as this book progresses. Uh, they they sort of throw away their old, young, naive identities, uh, and, and they man up and do what do what needs to be done in the face of of, <laughs> of difficult circumstances. So Rob does that, Catelyn does that, Arya does that, Sansa is arguably beginning to do that. Uh, uh, maybe Rick. Well, Jon Snow certainly does that. Uh, but Rickon, Rick on as well, perhaps, might be doing that in his own way. We, of course, haven't seen much of Rickon, uh, but one must wonder how Rickon might change from, like, this toddler, this crying toddler with his big wolf shaggy dog. Uh, how, how, how will he adapt to his changing circumstances? Apparently, he's now on the island of Scargos, an island of cannibals and wildlings and unicorns. So it may be that if, Rick, if Rickon is shaped by his circumstances and his surroundings, the Rickon Stark we find later in the series may well be a pretty fucking gnarly bloke, is what I'm trying to say. Still a five-year-old or six-year-old at this point, I suppose, uh, but a hell of a six-year-old, probably. If he's not dead. He might be dead. Who knows? Uh, anyway, so 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 this is a cool chapter. This is a chapter about transition and about character change. Uh, it introduces some interesting little little plot points about, like, the, the Dragonbone Dagger, which we'll have to talk about later, and, like, who sent the assassin. Uh, so, 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 and, 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 of course, there's always those undercurrents of, like, the mystical connections with, like, the Direwolves and Winterfell. Uh, and, of course, the overarching, like, political plot of, like, Starks versus Lannisters and all the other political shit at play. So, that was a cool chapter. Thank you for listening to this episode, and we'll have more uh, on 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 the on the moments to come. Cheers.